This is SAT Math Section 17. SAT Math Section 17 is ratios, rates, proportions, and units. An extremely important topic on the SAT College Board makes no bones about it. Uh, they say, you don't have to highlight this, I'm just drawing your attention to it. They do say in their materials that ratio and proportion is a major idea in mathematics. So you will see several ratios, rates, proportions, units, questions on every single test. Most of them are not all that difficult. It's pretty basic stuff that you've been dealing with since fifth, sixth, maybe seventh grade. Let's start working through this. In terms of recognizing ratios, rates, proportions, units, questions, it shouldn't be too hard to spot these. Obviously, if you see the word ratio or directly proportional or just the word proportional, I am gonna highlight those, I suggest you do the same. Those would be good giveaways that you are on a ratio or proportion question. Obviously, if you see a lot of units in your question, you may be dealing with one of these as well. There are a couple of other tip-off clues that tend to be pretty specific to the SAT ratio and proportion questions, uh, the questions that are asked on this test. So let's run through those right now. Uh, here in this info area, we are going to write uh, at this rate. So if you see the phrase at this rate, you may be dealing with one of these questions. If you see the words per or for every, which also obviously indicate that a rate is at hand. If you see, this is probably the most SAT-like tip-off clue. If you see a repetition, repetition of units or items, units slash items. And we'll see an example of that in a moment. But if you do see a repetition of a pair of units, let's say you see feet and gallons, and then in another place you see feet and gallons again, very, very good indicator that you may be on a ratio rate or proportion question. And then any scale model slash drawing, scale model, scale drawing questions. If you see a scale model or scale drawing, drawing you are almost certainly going to need to be uh, doing some of the strategies and techniques that we discuss in this session. Let's start talking about some of the basic proportion stuff that we will need to know for this test. And again, this should not be anything too surprising here. On the most straightforward proportions questions, you're really just going to set up that very typical, uh, you know, uh, x1 over y1 equals x2 over y2 type proportion, where you have one ratio or fraction being set equal to another ratio or fraction. We are going to go through a very step-by-step -step process here, even though, again, most of you should be abundantly familiar with this process. Um, I do want to lay this out and make it very concrete and very specific. So first of all, let's read through this example all the way through. Every three days, Kumar rides his bike 180 kilometers at this rate. How many kilometers will Kumar ride his bike in three weeks? So first of all, um, one of those more subtle tip-off clues does appear here. In fact, you might want to even highlight this. If you have multiple colored highlighters, you want, might want to use multiple colored highlighters. Um, you notice that we have this repetition of units. We have a kilometer unit repeated there, and then we have a time, in this case days and weeks are being mixed, time unit being repeated there. So that repetition of items or units, like I said above, very, very strong indicator that you're going to need to set up a proportion. In this case, we're just going to set up, uh, as I said, a basic proportion. So we need to circle uh, how many kilometers, how many kilometers in three weeks. That's what we need to figure out. So here's how we do this. Step number one, we are simply going to draw an equal sign and two fraction bars, one on each side of that equal sign. Step number two, which we will we will do with what we just drew here, this structure we just drew, we're gonna write in all of the knowns or givens in the appropriate slots. Obviously we have one, two, three, four slots, two numerators, two denominators. We're gonna write in the knowns or givens in the appropriate slot, uh, and then we are also going to, very, very important, 
we are going to write down the appropriate units. We're not just going to write numbers or variables. We're going to write units. So first things first, this says every three days, Kumar rides his bike 180 kilometers. So let's write three days in the numerator there, 180 km in the denominator. So again, I have filled in the numerator and denominator of the left-hand fraction with the first ratio that I am given in the question, and I have made sure that I have included my units. Now, the other information we have here is uh, that we're gonna ride the bike for three weeks. So we're going to write down, not three weeks, what we need to do to make sure that our units correspond. And by the way, this is why we write units, to make sure that our units are corresponding. We need to convert three weeks to a number of days. Most of you should know it's 21 days. However, you can do it the slightly more formal way by doing a little bit of a unit conversion, which we're about to talk about uh, on the next few pages. Uh, we'll do three weeks times um, uh, one week, seven days, weeks cancel, we get three times seven, so that's 21 days. And that's what's gonna go up there in the numerator so that our numerator units match. We have days in the numerator on the left, days in the numerator on the right. Great. Everything matches up. And then of course the unknown down here, we will do X km, X kilometers in the denominator. So we are going to, uh, in step two, it's what we just did. We filled in all of the knowns uh, in this position, this position, this position, and then we left an unknown in the one position that we didn't know. That's what the question is asking us. And then of course, typical equation solving tactics here. This is step three. We are mostly going to be just cross multiplying to solve this. So we are going to do three times X and we are going to get three X for this particular step. We can drop the units. I am going to bring up my calculator here because I'm not going to attempt at all to do 180 times 21 in my head. I'm going to do 180 times 21. By the way, vast majority of ratio and proportion questions will be in section four on the calculator section, which means you will uh, be able to use your calculator for these questions. We're going to divide both sides by three, of course. So divided by three and enter, and we get that L X equals 1260. And now we're going to bring back in the unit kilometers. Let's make sure that's what they asked. How many kilometers in three weeks? Yes, it is. And we're done. So again, that is the process. I know most of you are already familiar with that process. That's great. Um, but again, it's, it's good to have this all spelled out. Um, next page, we're going to do an example, a couple of examples here. So in example one at the top of the page, as always, you may want to pause the video and try to do this example on your own before watching me go through it. So for example one, setting up and solving a basic proportion, we've got Claire, she's making smoothies. Uh, the recipe requires three cups of juice and two cups of protein powder. It says that Claire did follow this recipe for each smoothie and used a total of 12 cups of juice. And then we need to find how many, how many total scoops of protein powder. Let's just circle, uh, that didn't look very good. Let's circle this whole thing right here. How many scoops of protein powder? So again, you notice you have that repetition of units. You've got cups, juice, you've got scoops, protein powder, you have got cups, juice, you've got scoops, protein powder. So there's that repetition of units, which is a dead giveaway that we're going to need to set up a proportion. In this case, we're going to do it with that basic proportion process that we just learned. So we're going to draw two equal signs. Uh, one equal sign, two fraction bars, one equal sign, two fraction bars. We are going to look at this first relationship, this first ratio, which is three cups juice, two scoops of protein powder. So I'm going to write three cups up there in the numerator on the left, and I'm going to write two scoops. Um, it's probably okay not to write juice and protein powder here since the cups and the scoops pertain to only one of those two things. Cups pertains to juice, scoops to protein powder. So we'll probably be safe doing that. And then this says 12 cups of juice. So clearly the cups, which are in the numerator on the left-hand side of the equal sign, those 12 cups need to be in the numerator on the right-hand side. And in the denominator, I have my unknown. So I'll write X scoops. We could also write an S um, or a P for protein powder. That would be perfectly fine. I'm going to keep it as X for now. 3X, we're cross multiplying now. 3X equals uh, 24. Again, we could do this in the calculator if we needed to, but these should be, um, we should be fine without our calculator here. So this is going to be eight. And remember, I'm going to bring back in my 
unit there that eight is the x and the x unit is scoops so eight scoops let's make sure that's what the question was asking how many scoops of protein powder it is and we are done we are going to write eight scoops scale model scale drawing questions are also generally solved using typical proportion setup and proportion solving steps um, we are going to do example two scale model scale drawing questions are not all that common on the test so let's just do this one and we'll move on again probably best to pause the video before you watch me work through this so in example two we've got a scale on an architect's drawing of a building shows that one centimeter is equal to two feet if the building's actual height will be 72 feet what is the height of the drawing so we need height of the drawing of the building that is what the question is asking us so again we've got centimeters feet we've got uh, feet we've got centimeters so certainly we have yet again that tip-off clue of uh, repetition of items or units so we are going to start by setting up a nice neat little proportion with our four spots two fractions on each side of an equal sign so what do we got here we got one centimeter equal to two feet again i'm writing my numbers and my units centimeters feet so centimeters feet will need to go uh, in these positions on the right as well we have a 27 feet so clearly that 27 feet needs to go down there in the denominator and of course the question is asking us for the height in this case i'm going to use h uh, for height uh, i will write my unit there as well and when we cross multiply here we get that 2h equals 27 we divide by 2 divide by 2 we get h equals we could just answer 27 over 2 uh, if this were a grid in we could we could um, grid in 27 over 2 that would be fine uh, or we could answer 13.5 so 13.5 and again we're going to bring in the unit back into that last step 13.5 is that what they were asking the height of the drawing in centimeters yes it is notice that we've got the this is the um the drawing and then this is the actual uh, the actual length the actual building so this is the actual height this would be the drawing height and indeed we are done 27 over 2 centimeters again you could do 13.5 would be that would be perfectly fine directly proportional there is a chance that you're going to encounter a question that says something about one quantity being directly proportional to another the process that we just used will work on these questions but it might also behoove you to understand that a directly proportional statement usually can be translated into an equation um, so if you see y is directly proportional to x or this language which can can be a little bit um, funky for for some students y varies directly as x uh, these two by the way they mean exactly the same thing there's no difference between those two statements so we can do this in one of two ways we either can just go ahead and set up a very um, a very similar type of equation to the ones that we just dealt with y1 over x1 equals y2 over x2 this equation is equivalent to saying that x and y are directly proportional to each other or another way to do this is with what is known as a constant of proportionality where we can translate the, the more direct translation might look like this y this is y y is the equal sign is the is directly proportional to x i'm going to put the x over here that directly proportional means that the relationship between x and y is such that we can find y by multiplying x by a constant of proportionality which i'm going to use uh, i'm going to use k to represent that constant of proportionality so this equation right here indicates that y is directly proportional to x and what that also means we might want to bring back in a little bit of what we've learned about linear functions remember you have uh, slope intercept form of a line being y equals mx plus b well if you look at this equation and you match some things up clearly you can see the y the equal sign and the x match up you can also see that your constant of proportionality in a direct proportion would be if we were to graph this direct proportion on the xy plane the constant of proportionality would be the slope of the line and then over here since we don't have a value written over here what that actually means is that the value i'm just going to do a little sort of ghosted value here um 
since we don't have a value written over there, what we're actually doing is we're, we're kind of just adding by, uh, we're adding zero. And when we add zero, we don't write plus zero. We just don't write anything. So a direct proportion is also a linear function with equation y equals kx plus zero. So you know your constant of proportionality is equal to your slope, your k equals m. And you also know that your y-intercept, your b equals zero, which means that a direct proportion will always be the graph of a straight line that goes through the origin. Graph of a straight line that goes through the origin where your slope equals the constant of proportionality. It may benefit you to know that on certain questions. We're going to translate a couple of direct proportion statements here using what we just learned. We are going to, on these examples, be using this version of the translation, the y equals kx using the proportionality constant. We do indicate here that you want to use k as the proportionality constant. You may want to pause the video and try example three on your own, although this might be slightly newer for some of you. So if you want to watch me work through it, that's fine. So in Example 3a, we have the distance stretched d varies directly as the force applied f. So uh, d is the distance stretched. That's what this language means. f is the force applied. Um, so what we are going to do is we're going to write d. And remember, varies directly as is exactly the same as is proportional to. And now all I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, put my f into that uh, slot there where we had put our x in the example above. So we can translate this statement, the distance stretched varies directly as the force applied as d equals kf, where k is the proportionality constant. And again, we should be able to see that in order to get the value for d, all we do is we multiply the value for the force by that proportionality constant, and we will have our value for the distance stretched. Example 3b, the area of a circle is directly proportional to the square of its radius. So the area of a square of a circle, a squircle, the area of a circle is directly proportional to, there's my proportionality constant, and I am multiplying that by the square of the radius. The square of the radius looks like that. In case this doesn't look familiar to you, it, it should look familiar to you. This is the area formula for a circle. If you simply replace k with the actual constant of proportionality, the proportionality constant, which is pi, the formula will look a lot more familiar to you. So that formula, a equals pi r squared, is actually just a direct proportion formula where your proportion of constant, uh, your sorry, your constant of proportionality is pi. Next, we on the next page we have. Uh, something that we've already talked about, so we can just race through this. Do recall, I, I just said that a direct propor directly proportional statement relates to a linear function in that when you see a statement like y is directly proportional to x, which again, um, uh, we would say y is directly proportional to x. So when graphed on the xy plane, this statement is, uh, we're going to write down a line with equation, and we'll just write that equation again, a line with equation y equals mx, and I'm just replacing the constant pro proportionality k with the m, a line with equation mx, and we're going to write slope is m, and in parentheses we'll write prop constant for proportionality constant, and y intercept is b. Uh, sorry, is zero, don't write B, is zero, which again, I'm just going to draw this one more time, means that we're talking about a line with slope of M or K that goes through the origin, goes through the point zero comma zero. Next, we've got to uh, sort of go backwards a little bit here and go from proportions back to ratios. Um, so ratios, remember, are going to play a role in every single proportion question that you that you see. Um, the word ratio, if it appears in the question, great. If it doesn't appear in the question, doesn't really matter. Proportions are comparisons of two ratios, which means, again, that ratios are part of pretty much every proportion question. When you see language like the ratio of x to y, you do need to understand that that can be expressed in one of three ways. The first is the way that it's already expressed. We could say x to y. So that's sort of the worded form uh, the worded way that we can express a ratio. We can also express with 
colon form. Sometimes we will see ratios expressed where there is a colon between the two quantities in the ratio. The most important, or I should say most beneficial way of expressing ratio is as a fraction. I'm gonna actually box this one over here, maybe even star it as well. That form of a ratio is going to be most beneficial to us as it will be most sort of mathematical to us. In other words, it will allow us to work with a ratio in an actual equation or expression. Let's go ahead and do an example that involves just some basic uh, ratios. We're gonna do example four. You might wanna pause the video and do this one on your own before watching me work through it. So in example four, we have uh, the table above shows the number of employees who intended an orientation, who intended orientation sessions over 10 consecutive weekends. Okay, so we can see the weekend dates and the number of employees uh, attending there. Uh, what is the ratio of the number of orientation sessions with less than 20 to the number of orientation sessions with 30 or more? We got to be careful here. The language, uh, even though they've they've underlined it for us. This, is, this can be tricky. You notice this is less than 20, so that doesn't include 20 itself, and you do see some 20s up here. And then this is 30 or more, so that does include 30. So let's do this. Let's do, uh, let's set this up so we don't make any careless mistakes. We'll do less than 20 to a ratio of less than 20 to 30 or more, and we'll do that down here. So let's find the 20, the less than 20 first. There's a less than 20 uh any other less than 20s there's a less than 20 i think that's about it for the less than 20 now 30 or more i'm going to box those just to differentiate them from the uh from the circle so 30 or more i've got one there i've got one there i've got one there that's 30 or more that's 30 or more and that so what do i have i have one two uh three four five six thirty or more so that's the denominator 30 or more and then i only have two of those circles which were the less than 20 items so that is two over six so we could write this in one of several ways um and again if this were a grid and we could just grid two over six that would be perfect fine i am going to go ahead and reduce this we could answer one third we could say that this is one to three using the colon, we could also answer with that worded form one, two, three. This would be the most reduced uh, form of the ratio. This would be not reduced. Uh, and again, it would just depend on the question. If you were on a multiple choice question, obviously you would be uh, confined by the answer choices as to which of these three forms you would need to answer in. If you were on a grid in, most likely you would be answering in the, uh, the fractional form. There is absolutely no way to answer um, with symbols or with words on the grid ends. Ratios and totals down at the bottom of the page. Ratios and totals. So occasionally what will happen is uh, you will see a question that combines ratio numbers and a question that also contains, um, sorry, you will see one question that contains ratio numbers and real numbers. And you've got to remember that ratio numbers are almost always expressed in relative or reduced values. For instance, that question that we just saw above, the the real values are the two and the six, right? That was the real number of uh, less than 20 and 30 or more items. But the reduced, the reduced ratio was one to three. So one and three were not the real numbers. They were just a reduced form of the real numbers. When you get questions that combine the two, um, you may need to, uh, especially if the question combines a ratio with a real total, that's actually the key here, that, that they might give you a real total, what you might have to do is convert the ratio to a fractional part. So I am going to, uh, and we, we, we actually say how to do that right here. I'm gonna give you a very simple example first um, over here, and then you can try example five on your own. So the simple example is if a, um, class, let's say you have a class of students and the ratio of um, males to females, males to females is, I don't know, five to seven. Okay, so there's five males, seven females. So first of all, note that we don't know for sure if there are five males and seven females. All we know is that the reduced relationship is five to seven. It could be that there's 10 males and 14 females or 500 males and 700 females, but the ratio reduces to this five to seven relationship. Well, if a question then said something like, um, there are, 
I don't know, uh, 24 total students, what you would need to understand is that you can't make a direct comparison, at least not right off the bat, you can't make a direct comparison between these two uh, numbers, the five and the seven and the 24, because number one, again, remember this 24 is a real number. These guys are read either the five nor the seven represents a total. So what you would do is you might say, well, I know that males make up five out of every five plus seven students, right? Five out of the total would be five plus seven. So males represent, I'm gonna write down five males out of 12 total. Males represent every five out of every 12 total. And again, I got that 12 total simply by adding the ratio numbers to create a total number of parts, or in this case, students. Now I can use this fractional part to relate to this total because I could do something like this. I could say five males, I'm just gonna write M for now, out of 12 total, I'll write tot for now, equals X males out of 24 total. So that now what I'm doing is I am relating my ratio numbers on the left, my real numbers on the right, I have my males in the numerator, I have my totals in the denominator, and I'm ready to go cross multiply and solve. So again, often if you see a question that is giving you ratio numbers, combined with a real total, you might want to, um, it's not always the best way to go, but often you're gonna wanna sort of, um, uh, not sort of, you're gonna wanna exactly add the ratio numbers to form uh, a ratio total, which is what we did down here with this 12. Go ahead and try example five on your own. So in example five, we have ratios and totals. We have in the election for student council president, 245 students voted for Evelyn. I am gonna pause right there and note uh, that that is, a, that is a real number. That is a real number. It says 245 students voted for Evelyn. If only juniors and seniors voted in the election and the ratio of juniors, so there's, now we're getting ratio numbers. Uh, juniors and seniors who voted for Evelyn was two to five. How many more, how many more seniors than juniors voted for Evelyn. So you do see we have that, uh, that mix of real numbers and ratio numbers here. Multiple ways that we can do this question. Um, some students have actually learned possibly a slightly more efficient method than the one that I'm going to use. If that's the method that you use, that's fine. I would suggest that you also be familiar with the way that I'm gonna do it. And the way that I'm gonna do it is very similar to what we did over here. I'm going to say, okay, well, I've got two juniors for every five seniors. So that's two juniors, five seniors. And remember, if I convert these into a fractional part, what do I do? I do two juniors over the total, which is two plus five. So I know that juniors make up two sevenths of the, uh, of the voters who voted for Evelyn. So two sevenths of 45, two sevenths of Two, four, two sevenths of 245, of 245. Two sevenths of 245, I'm going to go right into my calculator and I'm going to calculate two sevenths of 245. I'm gonna use my uh, fractional layout here. So two over seven uh, times 242, not two, one, 245, and I get 70. So that represents the number of juniors uh, that voted for Evelyn. Could I have set this up as a proportion where I said two juniors over seven total equals X juniors over 245 total? Yeah, that'd be perfectly fine. I'm, I'm not doing anything different over here than I did here to solve this proportion. We just multiply both sides by 245. And on the left there, you can see we're getting 245 times two sevenths, which is what I did here. So I've got 70 juniors. From that point, I could either use the five sevenths that were seniors. I could multiply five sevenths by 245. I could do it uh, that way, but I could also just now do 245 minus 70 juniors. That must give me the number of seniors. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that in the calculator, 245 minus 70. So there had to have been 175. Whoa, she was popular among the seniors. Um, 175 seniors. So the question was asking, how many more seniors than juniors? So I just now as a final step need to do 175 minus 70. So it means that, uh, that means that there are 105 more seniors that voted for Evelyn. 
uh, than juniors. So 105 is my final answer. That is what the question was asking. Hopefully that all makes sense. Again, there are multiple ways to do these questions, but uh, I think one very, very important ingredient is understanding how to relate your ratio numbers to, uh, to a total that is given. And the way that we normally do that is we can just add up the, uh, the parts of the ratio. At the top of the next page, we have to talk about unit conversions. Unit conversions are extremely common on the test. So we are gonna spend a few pages dealing with this. We're gonna do a bunch of examples. So settle in your seat. Unit conversions are just proportion questions, but we are going to, uh, for a lot of them, we're gonna handle them in a slightly different way than we would uh, those typical x over y equals x over y proportions. Uh, the first one here though, example six, we are gonna do with a uh, basic proportion like the ones that we've been uh, setting up. Uh, just a quick note over here, uh, when, we, when we talk about unit conversions, there will be questions on which you are gonna go from one unit to another unit and one or even both of those units might be slightly obscure to you. Uh, for instance, not many students know that one inch um, is equivalent to 2.54 centimeters. If you did know that, great. But like, again, a lot of students don't know that. In the cases where you've got an obscure equivalency, an obscure conversion to make, College Board generally will give you the conversion in the question. Although you should know that um, equivalencies related to time, they're not going to be given. You need to know that there are 60 seconds, in, 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour and 24 hours in a day and so on and so forth. Um, let's look at example six. Again, you might wanna try this on your own before watching me work through it. So how many minutes would it take a train to travel 90 kilometers at a constant rate of 120 miles, uh, sorry, 120 kilometers per hour? Uh, so we need how many minutes, how many minutes? That, that's all I'm gonna circle, how many minutes? So how are we gonna do this? Well, I'm gonna do this with the typical proportion solving steps that we've gone through on the, um, on the previous pages, I do want to point out once again, we've got that repetition of units, uh, two kilometers, two units of time. So I'm going to go ahead and draw my equal sign, draw my two fraction bars. I am going to use this relationship, this rate over here, 120 km, that is per or over or divided by one hour. Okay, so 120 kilometers per hour translates to this fraction over here on the left. And then I've got 90 kilometers. Clearly, kilometers need to go in the numerator. Note that I am writing all my units. And then we need minutes down here. So X minutes. Now, there's a slight problem because we've got hours over here, minutes over here. I believe I've said a couple of times that the units need to match up. Yes, these are both units of time, but they are not the same unit of time. So what I'm gonna do to make this really easy, uh, we don't need to do anything fancy here. Let's actually erase uh, the denominator over there and let's just make that conversion to 60 minutes. We know that one hour is 60 minutes. We'll just write 60 minutes there so that now our denominator units match. Now when I cross multiply, I get 120x equals uh, 60 times 90 should be 5400, but that's a, that's kind of a big calculation. So I'm going to do that in the calculator. 60 times 90, 5400 indeed. And now to solve for x, we divide by 120, divide by 120, we get x equals, let's divide that 5400 by 1, 2, not 1, 1, come on calculator, stay with me here. Uh, divided by 120 and we get 45. And again, as always, we bring back in the unit. Let's make sure that's what they asked. How many minutes to take uh, to travel 90 kilometers? Yes, that is what we found, 45 minutes. So I am gonna go ahead and write that in here, 45 minutes. Great. Conversions using um, conversion factors, using cancellation and conversion factors. A lot of students have already done work like this before in school. Um, some students know it as dimensional analysis. Other students have experienced this when they did stoichiometric conversions if they took a chemistry class. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about why this process works. I mean, it should be pretty obvious why it works. But um, what we're going to do is we're just going to lay out the process and then we're going to use it a few times on a bunch of examples. So what we do, if we just have a single step conversion, we just have to go from one unit to another unit. We write down the value that we're starting with along with that values unit. So we have starting units here. And what we want to do is we want to multiply by a conversion factor 
where the starting units are in the denominator, which will allow us to cancel the starting units, and we will have the desired units in the numerator, and once those starting units are canceled with each other, the only units we have left are desired units, so we end up with our final value in the uh, desired units. If we have a multi-step conversion, that usually just involves using multiple conversion factors to cancel out starting units. We will usually have some linking unit in between that we will also have to cancel out so that, again, we can end with desired units. Let's take a look at how this works. Again, most of you have done this before. Uh, you may want to go ahead and try example seven on your own as long as you feel confident doing the um, strategy that we just discussed. If you don't, then watch me do one or two of these and then maybe do the third one on your own. So we're going to perform these unit conversions. Again, what do we do? Uh, by the way, it does say that we're going to round decimal answers to the 10th. It's not uncommon that you will be directed to do that on a grid-in question. Grid-in questions usually require you to round to the nearest whole number or the nearest 10th. In this case, we're gonna do nearest 10th. So 25 minutes to hours. So again, remember the process. We write down the starting number along with the starting unit. We might even wanna just go over here and write down the desired uh, final unit, which is hours, so we need some number of hours. Well, how are we going to cancel out minutes? We are going to put minutes down here in the denominator. Notice I'm not writing in my numbers first and i strongly suggest that you don't do that i would get your units figured out first and then write in the numbers so i know that minutes has to be down there in the denominator so that the two minute units cancel uh obviously if i want to be left with hours i just need hours up here and then we can say well what is the relationship between hours and minutes and of course it is that there are 60 minutes in one hour so i fill in my 60 i fill in my one i'm going to go right in my calculator I can just do 25 divided by 60. I could do 25 times one over 60. That's what I'm gonna do in my calculator just so that it looks uh, in the calculator like it looks on the page. So I'm gonna do 25 times one over 60. The calculator is gonna give this to me in uh, decimal form. I could convert this to fractional form by hitting math, enter, enter. That's the conversion to uh, fraction. I am gonna answer in decimal form here. The question instructed, instructed me to round to the nearest 10th. The four there is in my uh, tenths place, my tenths digit, so I'm just gonna write down 0.4 hours. So two acceptable answers here would be 0.4 hours, or we could also say 5 twelfths hours. That would be perfectly fine as well. Next, we have uh, 65 grams to ounces, by the way, on that previous question, that 5 twelfths is just known as exact form. Uh, that 0.4 would be approximate form. On a grid in, if you answered 5 twelfths, you'd be perfectly fine. If you answered 0.4, you'd be perfectly fine. Um, the, the 5 twelfths, again, would be the exact form. 0.4 would be the form uh, where you have just truncated the decimal and rounded to the nearest tenth. By the way, why do we round to the four? Because there is a one in the hundredths position and therefore we just stay at four. In other words, we don't round up to 0.5. Um, let me get rid of that there. 65 grams to ounces. We are given the conversion factor here. We're given the equivalency because this is not a very well-known uh, equivalency. I do not know this equivalency. I'm assuming you do not either. So again, what do we do? We write our starting number. We write our starting unit. They give us the abbreviation for grams, so I'm just going to write a G there. We need ounces at the end over here, so equals how many ounces. So again, I'm going to set up my conversion factor first using the units. I know I need grams down there in the denominator to cancel the starting unit. I know I need ounces up here in the numerator so that I can end up with that desired ounces unit. And now I'm just going to fill in the numbers that they give me. The one goes with the G, the grams. The 0.04 goes with the ounces. And I'm going to do in my calculator 65 times 65 times 0.04 and I'm going to get 2.6. Well, that one's already rounded to the nearest tenth, so I am done. 2.6 ounces is my final answer. And number uh, 7C down here, we've got 14 feet being converted to yards, 14 feet. There's my starting number and unit. I need to get a certain number of yards over here. What do I do? I set up my conversion factor by putting feet down here, yards up here, starting, desired, and this is a 
place where you're going to have to know that there are three feet in one yard. Uh, you will, on some questions on this test, be required to know that. I suggest that you do. So I'm just going to do, in this case, 14. I'll just do 14 divided by 3. I get 4.666666 blah. I am going to round that up to 4.7. Uh, I could math enter, enter this, math enter, enter, and obviously I would just get back the 14 thirds. So we could answer 14 thirds. We could answer 4.7. Either one of those would be fine. That is it for the single step conversions. Um, let's do a couple of multi-step um, problems at the top of the next page. We've got example eight here, multi-step conversions. Uh, if you feel confident with these, try them on your own. If not, uh, watch me work through them. So we have got, uh, and again, notice we're rounding to the nearest 10th here. So we've got 650 millimeters meters and we need to get to feet and again there are two conversion factors here that we are given so uh, process is not all that much different I'm going to do 650 mm that's the starting number and unit I'm going to leave a little more space here and over here I'm going to do the the final unit which is feet so I know I need to get from millimeters to feet so the first thing I need to do is I need to cancel out those millimeters so I'm gonna put millimeters down here so those millimeters will cancel well all I need to do now there's not much I don't, I don't really need to think all that much about this there's only one conversion factor that has millimeters in it it's this second one it has 10 millimeters one centimeter so I know that's the conversion factor I'm gonna use here I've filled in my units now I do my numbers 1 and 10 uh, so now I've got centimeters, but I need feet. And so that means I need to cancel out centimeters. So centimeters must go down here. And I need to get, oh, look, there's there's actually one more conversion we're going to need to do. I probably didn't leave enough room there. I'm going to try to squeeze one more in. So I've got inches up here. I've got the 0.39 inches, one centimeter. Uh, if I cancel millimeters, cancel centimeters, and I'm left with inches, I still won't have what I need. So there is one more known, this is a three um, conversion factor question. There is one more should be known conversion factor I need to use, which is inches and feet. Inches need to be in the denominator so that they cancel out and I'm left with feet. And of course, one foot equals 12 inches. How am I gonna punch this in the calculator? Could I just do 650 divided by 10 times 0.39 divided by uh, 12, yeah, I could do it that way. I'm gonna actually do it uh, maybe slightly more safely where I, I just keep using these these fractions. So I'm gonna do alpha F1, enter. Um, that's a one and a 10. And then I'm gonna multiply that by 0.39. I don't need to put the denominator in there because the denominator is one. And then I'm gonna multiply that by, uh, again, I'm gonna enter a fraction in here. And that's going to be a 1 and a 12. And I'm going to hit enter and I get 2.1125 feet. Rounding to the nearest tenth, I get 2.1. So this is 2.1 feet. 2.1 feet. B, uh, example 8B, uh, this, is, this will look very familiar to anybody who has taken chemistry uh, in, in recent years. 2.994 times 10 to the 22nd atoms of carbon to grams of carbon. Okay, let's see how we're going to do this. So we've got to get from 2.994 times 10 to the 22nd atoms. Everything's carbon here, so I don't need to write the carbon. Uh, atoms, and I'm going to leave more space this time just in case. And we need to get to uh, grams. So how are we going to do this? Again, first we have to cancel out atoms. Only one of our conversion factors has atoms in it. It's this one. Some of you might recognize that number as Avogadro's number. Uh, so I'm going to put a 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Got a little crunched up there in the denominator. And then there's one mole. So one mole is equal to uh, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. And then, of course, so now atoms will have canceled. And now I'm going to be in moles. I need to get rid of moles um, so I'm going to put moles in the denominator with this other conversion factor. One mole equals 12 grams and grams in the numerator. And indeed, once everything else cancels, I'll be left with grams. And now filling these in, I've got 12, I've got one, and I should be able to multiply these and get what I need. Now in the calculator in the TI-84, 
uh, there is a very easy way to enter in the times 10 to the 22nd, in other words, to enter in scientific notation um, without putting your calculator into scientific notation mode. It is this EE button right here. What we can do is we can do 2.994. Yes, I could just go ahead and enter times 10 to the 22, but again, the slightly easier, more efficient way to do this is to hit the second. I'm going to do that again just so you can see 2.994 and then I'm gonna hit second, and then this EE -E button. That E basically stands for all of this stuff, the times 10, and then the into the exponent, so I'm gonna do 22 there. I'm gonna multiply that by alpha F1, enter, I've got a one in the numerator, and in the denominator, I'm gonna do something similar, 6.022 second E23. So now I've got that scientific notation number in the denominator there, and then I'm going to multiply by, I'm just gonna do times 12, I don't need to do the fraction there, times 12, and I get uh, 0.596, whatever, rounding to the nearest 10th, that nine means I've gotta round that 0.5 up to 0.6. So this should just be 0 0.6, 0 0.6 grams. 0.6 grams of carbon. So 2.994 times 10 to the 22nd atoms of carbon will be um, just over a half of a gram of carbon. That is a couple of examples of multi-step conversions. We're gonna do a couple more. Example nine, go ahead and read it. Try to work through it on your own. So in example nine, we have uh, Fredo uh, Fredo Corleone, uh, making some pies. Uh, each pie requires three pounds of apples. Apples costs uh, apples cost 95 cents per pound. Fredo makes four pies. How much? So how much dollars uh, on apples? Okay, so let's take a look at this. We're starting with um, four pies, and we need to get that in terms of dollars, right? Four pies equals how many dollars. So that's what I'm gonna do over here. I'm gonna write four pies, and then I'm gonna put an equal sign, and I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put the dollar sign over here. I know it should go to the left, but I'm gonna put my, just to be consistent with what I've already done, I'm gonna put my dollar sign over here. I have to end up in dollars. So now what I've gotta do is start canceling pies and canceling some other units so that I can end up with only dollars. So where's the first place I see uh, pies? I see it here, I see each pie is three pounds of apples. So I'm going to do pi and a, I'll just do APP for apples. So one pi of three, actually, no, I'm gonna do three pounds. I'll do three pounds. One pi, three pounds, uh, APPS. Okay, so now pies will have canceled and I'll have pounds of apples. And now I can see that there's something else about pounds here, so this says apples cost 95 cents per one pound. So I can put a pound down there and cents up here. So I've got now, uh, I gotta fill these numbers in. So 95 cents, one pound. So now the pounds will have canceled and I'll be left with cents, but I still need that dollars over there. How am I gonna cancel the cents to get dollars? Well, I know how dollars and cents relate. I'm gonna put cents down there. I don't know why I put the dollar on the left this time, but. I did deal with it. Um, so what do we got? We've got a uh, one dollar a hundred cents that we should know. If you don't know that, uh, I don't know what to tell you. Don't let anybody try to sell you anything. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and again in the calculator we are going to do four times three times ninety five. And then uh, I'm gonna do times one over 100 again, just to be to be safe. Make sure I don't make any careless mistakes, any of uh, order of operations careless mistakes. So I get 11.4. So that should be my final answer: is that he is going to spend 11 dollars and uh, 40 cents on apples. Um, if this were a grid in, you could also answer. I don't know what that would be. 50, 50 something over five. Um, I could math enter enter that actually uh, math enter enter so 50 57 over 5 would be a valid answer on a grid in as well uh, example number 10 um, here what we're gonna need to do is we're gonna need to be changing numerator and denominator uh, units in a in a rate fraction go ahead and read through number 10 you might want to try it on your own 
So here we have a three-toed sloth traveling 3.2 meters in 10 minutes. Uh, we need the sloth's average speed in kilometers per hour. So again, you can see we've got meters and minutes. We need kilometers and hours. So we're going to be changing both of these uh, units in the rate, the original rate that we're given. So we need average speed in kilometers per hour. So here's what we're going to do. Again, I'm going to set up my starting rate. So 3.2 meters, 10 minutes. Make sure you don't use M's for both of those or you're going to get confused. Uh, what do we need in the numerator? We need to get to kilometers. Uh, this is one of those cases where you are going to need to know that a kilometer is 1000 meters. Um, so how am I going to get rid of meters and end up with kilometers? I'm going to be, oh, by the way, I should probably write down my desired or final units over there kilometers hours so if i need kilometers up there in the numerator and i need my meters to cancel i'll have to have meters down in the denominator kilometers up in the numerator so i've got a thousand kilometers one meter oh that's not right what am i talking about uh it's the it's the opposite thank god i caught that um we're going to do one kilometer one thousand meters and then we are going to now have to get that minutes canceled uh, from the denominator, which means now I need to put minutes up here in the numerator so they will cancel and I will need uh, hours in the denominator. So minutes, hours, I obviously should know that 60 minutes is one hour and it looks like my final units will be those kilometers and those hours. So everything does look good here. Bringing up my calculator, alpha, F1, enter. I'm, whoa, what's going on there? Uh, I am going to do uh, 3.2 over 10. Uh, then I'm going to do times times alpha F1, enter. I've got a 1 and a 1,000, 1, 1,000. And then I've got times 60. I don't need to put that in fractional form. And it, wow, this sloth is going slowly. So this is... Uh, 0.0192 they want rounded to the nearest hundredth here so that's that one the one's going to round up to a two so this is 0.02 and remember this number here is over one so this is just 0.02 kilometers per one hour in other words 0.02 kilometers per hour it looks like that should be my answer average speed in kilometers per hour yes it is so 0 0.02 uh, kilometers per hour slow sloth Next page, what do we have? We have conversions involving square or cubic units. These questions are very rare. I wouldn't worry too much about them. When they do show up, they can be a little bit tricky. Some of you might already know how to deal with this. A lot of you probably don't. When conversions involve square or cubic units, in other words, units of um, area or units of volume, that's very frequently the context in which you'll see questions like this. Um, you have a couple of options. You can either perform the linear conversion first. We'll take a look at both of these in a moment so you know what the heck I'm talking about. You can perform the linear conversion first and then try to determine the area or the volume using those converted linear units. That, that's option A. Option B is that you can either square or cube your conversion factors so that your units cancel appropriately. On example 11, we're going to do both methods so that you can see how they both work you might want to not do 11 on your own if you want to if you insist on doing it on your own you can but you might want to watch me go through this so you know what i am talking about so again here we've got a rectangular surface of a concrete slab that has a length of 30 feet a width of 18 feet and we want to know the surface area in square yards of this concrete slab so method a method a which is where we're going to first convert the linear units will look like this. So we have got a 30 feet by 18 feet rectangular slab. Well, a rectangular slab, um, a rectangular slab. So if I want to go ahead and find the area in square yards, I can first start by, um, that's redundant, I can start by converting the 30 feet and the 18 feet to yards. So I'm going to do that down here, 30 feet 
times I want to cancel out feet and get yards. So again, remember this is one yard, three feet. This is just going to equal, those guys are going to cancel. This is going to equal 30 divided by three or 30 times one third is 10. So that is 10 yards. So now up here, I know that I've got a length or whatever you want to call that, the width, the length of 10 yards. And then this other dimension, I can already see that I, from, from the calculation I just did, I just need to divide the 18 by three. That's what I did to the 30, divide by three to get 10. So I'm just gonna divide the 18 by three, 18 over three, just making it, try to make it go a little bit faster. So I'm gonna get six yards there, six yards. So 10 yards times six yards is simply 60 square yards, 60 square yards. 10 yards, 10 times six, 60 yards times yards, square yards. So I get 60 square yards. That is my area. So again, that's method A, where we first converted the linear distance, the 30 feet and the 18 feet. Those are units of or measurements of length, of lines, of distance. We converted those to the yard unit, and then we found our area. Now, the other way that we can do this is we can simply start by finding the area in square feet and then convert, convert that unit, square feet, to square yards. And the way that we do that is as follows. So we are going to do 30 feet times 18 feet, and we are going to get in our calculators 540, and remember that will be square feet. We're multiplying feet by feet, we get square feet. Sounds painful, square feet. Um, imagine walking around on square feet. Um, 30 feet by 18 feet is 540 square feet. Now in order to convert this square footage to square yards, the big mistake that everybody makes is they do this. They do 540 feet squared and they think that they can simply multiply by this conversion factor where you've got one yard equaling three feet. The problem with that is that feet squared and feet don't cancel. Again, this is a unit of area. This is a unit of length or distance. A unit of area and a unit of length or distance do not cancel each other. Feet squared, feet squared over feet would actually give you feet, right? Because feet squared is feet times feet. And the denominator there, feet, is just feet. Well, one of those feet's cancel, but the other one doesn't. So multiplying feet squared by something over feet will not fully get rid of the feet squared. So what we need to do is this, it's quite simple. We just have to square the conversion factor. And if we square the conversion factor, what we end up with, I'm gonna write down this intermediate step here so you can see, one yard times one yard, right? I'm squaring that numerator. One yard times one yard is one square yard. One times one is one. Yard times yard is, uh, yards times yards is square yards and then the denominator we've got three feet squared three feet times three feet three times three is nine feet times feet is feet squared so now i have an appropriate conversion factor here where the feet squared will indeed cancel and i will end up with yard squared 540 feet squared uh divided by nine 540 divided by nine indeed is going to be 60 yards squared, which is exactly what we got the first time. So those are the two methods. Um, I will tell you that, you know, whether you find one of these easier than the other, uh, that that's all fine and good, but there might be certain questions on which you have to use one, uh, one method over the other. Like for instance, if they had simply asked you, let's say they had not given you the initial linear measurements, they had just gone right to, okay, a certain rectangular slab has an area of 540 square feet. You are sort of forced to use uh, the second method, method B. You really can't make, I mean, there, there is a way you could, but, but it would be very difficult and, and um, tricky to try to make the linear conversion first. Example 12 down at the bottom, um, we're going to do a, an example involving cubic units. You might want to try this on your own since we now have a little bit of experience with this. So in example 12, we've got a soda can with a volume of 3.3 times 10 to the fifth cubic millimeters. What is the volume of the can in cubic centimeters? And we are given a conversion factor here. So again, as always, we write down our initial value with the initial unit. I'm going to write cubic millimeters like this, cubic millimeters. Uh, what do we need? We need cubic 
centimeters, cubic centimeters over here. So what do I need to multiply by? Well, I clearly need to get rid of that millimeters cubed. So obviously I've got a millimeters that needs to go in the denominator, but I'm gonna need to make that millimeters cubed in a moment. I'll put the centimeters in the numerator. How do I know I want millimeter there, centimeter there? Well, that just comes from the conversion factor. I can see they're giving me a way to convert centimeters to millimeters. Um, so I'm gonna put the millimeters down there, centimeters up there. I'm gonna fill in the appropriate numbers that are given in the conversion factor. And now remember, in order to cancel millimeters cubed, I need that denominator to be millimeters cubed. In order to get centimeters cubed, I need that numerator to be centimeters cubed. So in this case, I'm gonna cube my conversion factor. And I'm going to end up with 3.3 .3 times 10 to the fifth millimeters cubed, millimeters cubed times one cubic centimeter over uh, 10 cubed. I could do that in the calculator, but I know it's going to be um, 1,000, 100 is 10 squared, 1,000 is 10 cubed. So this will be 1,000 cubic millimeters. And now I am ready to get my number of cubic centimeters because my cubic millimeters will cancel. I will go right into the calculator. I am going to do this. How do I want to do this? I'm going to do this with alpha F1, enter. I'm going to do 3.3. Uh, I'm going to use that E button there, uh, times 10 to the fifth, all over one, one, two, three, and I'm going to hit enter, and I'm going to get 330 cubic centimeters. 330 cubic centimeters is the answer to this question. Moving along to the next page, we just got one, one and a half pages left, two pages left. Uh, bear with me, I know it's getting long, but there is a lot you need to know for this. As I said, it's a very important uh, concept with a lot of aspects to it. So at the top of the next page, we've got rate statements containing per or for each. If you've been paying attention to what we've done so far, these shouldn't be all that much more difficult, but it is important for you to understand that per or for each simply mean division. So if you see some quantity per some other quantity, usually it just means take whatever is here and whatever is here and divide the first one by the second one. In other words, if they say x per y, x per y simply means the x divided by or over the y. Uh, and you can write it in fractional form. You can then simplify it and so on and so forth. So in example 13, uh, I might try these on your own. Most of you shouldn't have too much trouble with these. So in example 13a, we need to determine the indicated rate. This says a city has an area of 85 square miles and a population of 630,000 people rounded to the nearest whole number. What is the population density in people per square mile? So again, what that means is we need a fraction in which people is in the numerator and square mile is in the denominator. Well, we're given the square miles and the people right there. So we're gonna do 630,000 630,000 people over 85 square miles. And when we divide and simplify this, we are going to get 630,000 divided by 85. And we get this 7411.7, what did they say? Rounded to the nearest whole number. So it's gonna be 7412. So our population density in people per square mile is 7,412 people for every square mile, one square mile, 7412 per square mile, 7412 people per one square mile. Uh, B, uh, 13B here, it took Doug and Ross two hours and 23 minutes to drive 128 miles. What was their average speed? So average speed in miles per hour. I didn't circle this up here, population density people per square mile, we should circle that. So average speed in miles per hour. So we need, again, we need a fraction in which we've got miles in the numerator, per means divided by, and hours in the denominator. So the miles is easy, that's 128 miles. But you notice we've got these mixed time units, two hours and 23 minutes. We need the denominator to be purely in hours. So we've got to convert that 23 minutes to hours and then we'll add it to the two hours. So let's do that over here. 23 minutes is my starting number and unit. What do I need to do? I need to multiply by a conversion factor that has minutes in the denominator so that minutes cancel, hours in the numerator. And what do we know? We know that there are 60 minutes in one hour. So 23 
divided by 60. I'm just gonna do it that way here. 23 divided by 60, that gives us this 0.3838 whatever. I'm gonna add that to the two. And now I'm gonna math enter enter so they don't shave off any decimal accuracy. Let me do that in fractional form. So this is gonna be 143 over 60. Very important, especially when you are on the grid ins that you do not uh, in intermediate steps shave off any decimal accuracy. Like for instance, if you were to do 2.38 here or 2.4, there is a chance that your final answer will not be as accurate as it needs to be. So that's why I'm keeping this in exact form. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do 128 divided by, and I'm gonna copy paste that fraction here. Uh, I really should put that fraction in parentheses. So I'm gonna go uh, before it and enter a parentheses in there. It doesn't really matter. It's actually going to delete those parentheses, I believe, but oh no, it kept them in there. So I get 53.7.706 uh, rounded to the nearest whole number that is going to be 54. So that will be my speed in miles per hour. So this will all collapse to or simplify to 54 miles per one hour. So my uh, average speed or Doug and Ross's average speed is going to be 54 mph or 54 over 1 miles per hour. Either way is fine. That is example 13. Moving along, we've got to know how some of these um, proportion, these rate statements will relate to uh, linear functions and, and slopes. Let's take a look at number 14. You might want to try this on your on your own. For some of you, it might not be completely clear how this all integrates. Um, so we have the cost in dollars, cost C in dollars of a cab ride can be modeled by the equation C equals 0.4 times D, where D is the number of quarter miles driven. What is the cost in dollars? Cost dollars for each mile driven okay so how are we going to do this we are going to first of all let's write out c equals 0.4 d let's also note that this kind of looks a lot like y equals m x right it looks like a linear function c is the y 0.4 is the slope d is the x so we need the cost uh in dollars for each mile driven well let's look at what's going on here this d is in uh quarter miles this c is in dollars and what that means about this 0.4 is that the units of that 0.4 in order to cancel out quarter miles let's actually look how this would work in order to cancel out that quarter miles and be left with dollars that means that in the numerator we must have dollars right whatever this this point four is its units must be dollars over quarter mile dollars over quarter mile then the quarter miles will cancel and we'll be left with dollars equals dollars and all is uh, all is good with the world um, the other way that we could look at this is again because we know that that point four is the slope remember this is just an alternate way of looking at this the slope is a delta y change in y over change in x we said that our y here is c and our x is d right uh, y is c x is d so i'm just substituting there c for y d for x and then in terms of units remember that c has units of dollars and the, the d is the number of quarter miles so that's quarter miles so again just confirmed uh, what we found up here that that point four that point four must therefore be 0.4 dollars over one quarter mile that's what 0.4 is 0.4 over one uh, and the units must be dollars per quarter mile. So we know it's 0.4 dollars per one quarter mile. And now we can do this multiple ways, but probably the easiest way is to just do 0.4 dollars over one quarter mile equals how many dollars over one mile, which is simply four quarter miles. Of course, we could also have done 0.4 dollars over um one fourth mile right that's what a quarter mile is equals uh, x dollars over uh, one mile either way it doesn't really matter how we do this we could do it uh, either way uh, we are going to get uh, 1.6 dollars as our answer if we cross multiply here we cross multiply here we're going to end up with 1.6 
$1.6. So it is $1.6 for a full mile. It is $0.4 for each quarter mile. At the top of the next page, finally, we are coming to an end here. I will say that with work questions, these are phenomenally rare. We've seen maybe one or two of these, uh, and, and one of them wasn't even really um, a work question itself. I'm just going to tell you that you shouldn't worry too much about these, uh, especially if you are not going for a score close to 800. Uh, you definitely shouldn't worry too much about these. Um, if you are, however, and you need to get every last darn question, I will recommend that you simply memorize the formulas for work questions. It's probably the best way to do most of these. Um, if the formulas are memorized, a lot of these questions shouldn't be too difficult. The formulas are as follows, and keep in mind, these are all just different forms of the same formula. These, these are equivalent formulas we're just sort of manipulating to get from one to the other. So one of them is one over T sub A plus one over T sub B equals one over uh, T sub T. And all of those variables, T sub A, T sub B, T sub T, are defined down here. So T sub A is the time it would take person A working alone to complete the job. Uh, T sub B would be the time uh, it would take person B working alone to complete the job. And T sub T would be the total time. Uh, by the way, these, are, these formulas are for combined rate work questions, where you've got two people working at um, their own separate rates working together to complete a job. These formulas relate um how long it would take each individual person to do a job with how long it would take them to do the job together or at what rate they would work together the next uh formula we can get by simply multiplying all the terms here through by t sub t so we would get t sub t over t sub a plus t sub t over t sub b equals one uh, so again these two equations are pretty much exactly the same we've just multiplied through by uh, uh, t sub t. And then finally over here we get maybe the simplest equation which is rate a plus rate b equals rate total. And what that is is uh, we've got the rate that uh, a works at in uh, number of jobs per amount of time um, and the rate that b works at and then the rate that they would work at together. So if we simply add a's rate to b's rate we would get the total rate. We're going to try one example and then we are wrapping this up. In example 15, of course, we're doing a combined rate work. It's a long question, so I'm not going to read it all out. I'm just going to, you should read it uh, to yourself. You might want to pause the video and do that. Uh, I'm going to circle what they're asking here. Uh, Anthony working alone. How many hours um, to rake and bag the leaves, rake and bag the leaves. Okay, so what we are given here is we've, we're given that Carmela can rake the leaves in three hours, and then we're given their combined uh, time. We're, we're given the amount of time that they can, uh, if they work together, rake and bag the leaves from this lawn. So I'm gonna use that first uh, equation up above. I'm gonna do one over uh, three hours right? Uh, so that is, in this case, that's time for what? Carmela uh, plus one over, I don't know, Anthony's time. That's what we need. So that's uh, Anthony's time. And that's going to equal one over the total time, which is one hour and 40 minutes. In order to make everything in hours here, I do need to convert that 40 minutes to hours. 40 minutes times hours over minutes. So this is 61 hour. So what is that going to be? It's going to be two thirds, four over six, two thirds. So that's one and two thirds, uh, one and two thirds hours, one and two thirds hours. I could do this with the calculator. I probably should do it with the calculator, but I'm going to do uh, that old little trick one times three plus two. So that's five thirds hours. Hopefully you guys know how to convert a mixed number into an improper fraction. Like I just did, you multiply the whole number by the denominator, add that result, add that product to the numerator, put all that in the numerator of the improper fraction and keep the denominator as the uh, denominator in the mixed number. So five thirds hours is their total. And now I've got this really, well, I don't know if it's the easiest equation to solve, but it, it shouldn't be 
too difficult to solve this. Um, how are we going to solve this? Probably the easiest way is to subtract one third from both sides. Right, I'm just getting rid of that one third over there. Um, so I get one over a T sub A equals, I'm gonna do this in the calculator, no reason to do this in my head. Uh, I'm going to do alpha F1, enter one over, I'm gonna put another fraction down there in the denominator. Um, so that's gonna be the five thirds. And then I'm subtracting from all of that. So that's one over the five thirds. I'm subtracting from all of that a one third. So minus one over three and I hit enter. I get this ugly number up that I'm gonna to convert to a fraction by hitting math, enter, enter. So I get four over 15 and I could either just reciprocate that or I could cross multiply and I get four times Anthony's time equals 15, divide both sides by four. So it is the case that Anthony would take 15 over four uh, hours, which is equivalent to 15 divided by four is equivalent to 3.75, 3.75 hours. Either of those would be acceptable, 15 over four hours. So again, I just used the first equation. I could have used the second equation as well. That would have been fine. Actually might have been even easier to do uh, that one. Uh, even the third equation, I, I could have finagled this question to use the third equation. Again, all those equations are equivalent. Um, I just chose to use the first equation where I'm just putting all of the different times in the denominators. This was the unknown time and I had to solve for that. So that is a combined rate work question. Again, I wouldn't worry too much about those. You're not going to see many or really even any of those. That is finally it for ratios, rates, and proportions. I know that it was a lot. I know it was a long video, um, but I don't apologize for that. There is a lot to know. You've got to know um, how to make unit conversions, how to set a proportion, how to translate proportions, how to relate proportions to linear functions. There is a lot to know for ratios, rates, and proportions. And as always, I would suggest coming back to this section often uh, and reviewing it often.